Yes, Gene Ripley. I'm from Dover Foxcroft. I'm an organic farmer in Dover Foxcroft, and um, my farm lies near where one of the possible routes that this could go were to be built. Um, and I grew up in Washington County in the town of Harrington. Um, so in 1999, whether or not you knew it, some of those tax dollars that you paid went to fund a study that was conducted by the Maine Department of Transportation. And the study looked at different options for improving east-west transportation in the state. And on each of the different options that they evaluated, what the economic impacts would likely be on the state. And so this was a taxpayer-funded study. and proceeded in the proper sequence of actually evaluating different options and looking at the impact on the state, on the public, before going ahead and throwing money at a project to start building it. Um, and so the 1999 study did two things. One was it looked at similar highways in northern New England. And so it looked at I-89 and I-91, which are in Vermont and New Hampshire. And it looked at the several decades after those two highways were built and what kind of economic <laughs> impacts followed the construction of those highways in the states that they were built in and in particularly the regions that they passed through. That's one of the things it did. The other thing it did was to look at um, projections and predictions of what would happen in Maine um, to um, towns that this ran through, areas that it ran through what would happen to existing um, traffic flow and existing economic patterns, and what kind of an economic impact we would see in Maine from building this highway. And in Vermont and New Hampshire, what they found when they compared um, these two highways and looked at the economic impacts that followed the construction of them was two things. They found that there was no economic benefit to the states from the construction of the highways and that there was jobs and businesses lost in towns all along the entire course of the highways due to what they termed the bypass effect of traffic being sucked out of downtowns, rural towns, um, to new box stores that were built at a few exits at the largest existing cities um, in these states. And so it was basically a job transfer. Local businesses, local jobs were lost. Um, some new jobs were created at certain exits. And in Maine, when they looked at the um, predicted economic impacts of building an east-west highway from New Brunswick to Quebec, what they saw was they predicted that they would see the same bypass effects here, that we would see the same lack of economic benefit, the same loss of jobs, the same loss of businesses, particularly in our towns all along the corridor. In Maine, the proposed route for this currently only passes near one large city along the entire thing. And in Vermont, New Hampshire, the only economic activity that happened at all, economic growth, was at the large cities. Everywhere else saw lost jobs and lost businesses. Um, the 99 study particularly singled out Washington County as suffering major economic losses because of the bypass effect, because Washington County is primarily served by existing east-west roads in Route 9 and Route 1, and that they saw that this highway would pull a lot of traffic off of those roads. They actually predicted that Route 9 would see nearly 100% loss of traffic if the highway were built, and that um, Route 1 would see 2,300 less vehicles per day traveling it. And so picture Route 1 you know, through Machias, through Millbridge. Um, with 2,300 less vehicles on it. That's 2,300 less vehicles and less people and families bringing their money into these towns, spending it at businesses in all the towns along Route 1. Um, what the study also found in Vermont and New Hampshire and predicted would be the same in Maine is that um, manufacturing jobs continued to decline in the regions near the highways in Vermont and New Hampshire the highways didn't mitigate any loss to manufacturing jobs. It looked just like the rest of northern New England. Um, there was no population growth that followed the construction of the highways in the regions that they passed through. And in fact, the highways weren't enough to stop continuing out migration um, from the regions that the highways passed through. So it was very similar to the rest of northern New England. There was no economic stimulation that they could attribute to the highways being built. And so the reason that the 1999 study is so important is because 
the current proponents of this new new proposal for an east-west highway um, have been traveling around the state advertising this project to the public, to our towns, particularly to the towns that lie along the proposed route. And they're advertising it as an economic stimulus, they're advertising it as something that would create jobs, they're advertising it as something that would bring the kids back, reverse out migration, um, bring population growth, um, bring back manufacturing. And they have absolutely no data to base any of these claims on. And in fact, the data that we do have, which again, this is from a very thorough official study funded by our taxpayer dollars, says the exact opposite on every single one of those points. It says no economic benefit, it says lost jobs, and this is the most recent, most comprehensive study that we have, and that's the data that we have. Um, so, so why do, why does this matter to you if you don't live in uh, a town right along the route that, that might see this kind of job loss? Well, the um, 1999 study, and another thing that it did was um, it collated all the information it gathered, and it evaluated several different um, alternatives for improving east-west transportation, some of which were newly built highways. And like I've said, they found economic harm to the state from any new, newly built highway. But they also looked at upgrading existing east-west roads. And in the case of upgrading the existing roads, they found that it would actually uh, economically benefit the state to do that. And out of this 1999 study, the state set uh, transportation priorities that we've been following ever since and putting taxpayer dollars to implementing. And those priorities are to upgrade the existing east-west roads. And we've seen that with Route 9, with Route 2, with other roads um, across Maine. And, and they've nearly completed the plan to improve east-west transportation in the one way that this study showed would actually economically benefit the state, which was by upgrading our existing roads. And so this current proposal runs directly counter to our existing statewide transportation priorities that were defined out of this 1999 taxpayer-funded study. And that study found that spending any money at all even if we only spent, you know, if we didn't spend a single cent on building a new highway, that was still going to cause economic harm to our towns. It wasn't about how much it would cost to build, it was about the very existence of it. And this is important because Chimbro Corporation, the main proponent of the project, has been traveling around saying how this is going to be a totally private project and it's going to be totally privately funded and isn't going to cost the state anything and is going to economically benefit the state. And again, the state's already evaluated this with our taxpayer dollars, shown that to not be true. And every, as Chris mentioned, every single highway in this country that has private sector involvement is a public-private partnership, which means public involvement, public cooperation, public subsidy. And um, a public-private partnership, what that means is that you have the public subsidizing the expenses of a private project. The public helps to pick up the tab on the expenses of the project. The private entity re retains control of all income from the project. So it's a taxpayer handout to private companies to increase their profits. And in Maine, Maine's public-private transportation law says that the state, the taxpayers, can pay up to 50% of the initial capital costs of any transportation project. And Chimbro has been going around and touting this as a project that would cost them $2 billion. $2 billion. So up to 50% of the cost, we can see that we're easily running into the billions of dollars as a potential taxpayer contribution to this project that runs against the economic interests of the state of Maine and the people of Maine. Five minutes. And, um, and Chimbro's budget for this project leaves out many, many, many aspects of the um, costs of the highway. As Chris mentioned, it's not even for the four-lane highway they're touting. It only covers basically half the highway. It covers two lanes with an alternating truck lane similar to Route 9. So the other half of that, as Maine's private partnership law allows, 
it appears that they're looking to us taxpayers to cover the other half of the project. And the developers of this proposal want a subsidy to make this a more attractive investment. And they're looking for that subsidy from taxpayer dollars. They're looking for the subsidy from our jobs and businesses, as this 1999 study showed that is what we're going to lose if this goes through. And they want to retain control of all the private profit that will come from it, though. And I mean, everyone here knows as well as I do, in these economic times especially, we can't afford, taxpayers cannot afford to be massively increasing taxes. Our entire budget for the state for a year is $3 billion. We're looking at running into the billions of dollars to subsidize this project. And our towns and businesses cannot bear the cost of, of losing businesses, losing jobs. Um, and all around, this project has the potential to break, break our state and towns economically. And I'm going to pass it on. Actually, we're going to run a brief segment of a video here from a transportation expert from last year discussing the um, commercial likelihood of Eastport being developed into a larger port as a result of an East-West Highway, which is another claim that Chimbrough Corporation has been making. And this transportation expert discusses the likelihood of that. And I know something about this great transportation. I ran international sales and marketing for CN for five years. So I know a little bit about container freight. And um, one of the pillars that, that folks talk about for East West Highway talks about Panama Canal and how the uh, expanding the locks is going to drive uh, more freight through the canal and less freight uh, trans uh, and, and I think that's probably true. Um, it might surprise you to learn, um, and I got the numbers last night, in 1995, 200,000 containers went through the Panama Canal. In 2011, 6.6 million went through. We've already seen an enormous expansion through Panama, okay? Um, but I haven't seen any ships calling Searsport, or Eastport, or Portland, or Boston. Why is that? Containers go where people are. Okay, so if I'm a steamship line, I make the most money if I can take my box off and give it to my customer. Any more inland transportation costs me more money. So I would prefer to get the ship as close to where the people are as I can possibly do it. So if I'm a ship and I'm a big ship, I'm going to New York. I don't care where else I'm going, but I'm going to New York. And because I'm a big ship and it costs me so much to operate, I'm going to fewer ports, not more ports. So that's, that's the economics of steamship lines. I want to get my ship on the ocean, I want to stop once, and I want to go back. Ultimately, that's what I'd like to do. Okay? So, so when you think about what might happen, um, I don't think that the pie of containerized freight is going to grow significantly because of Panama. The, the containerized freight is what it is. Now, you got to understand, this is not a static environment. The big ports in, in North America, and, and I have them here, uh, Los Angeles, Long Beach, New York, New Jersey, uh, Savannah, uh, Port of Vancouver, uh, Oakland, and Seattle, all of them have a lot of um, uh, tax revenue, a lot of jobs, a lot of economic vitality tied up in their port. And they're not going to let that go easily. And so they're going to adapt and change. Um, two examples for you. Los Angeles um, was at a congestion point uh, where they couldn't take any more freight traffic about five years ago. And the response to that was BN and UP, the Burlington Northern and the Union Pacific Railroad, uh, got together and said, you know what, we're going to make more capacity. So they made a $32 million facility and triple tracked 182 pound welded out in the middle of the desert to take the stuff out of the port and into the desert. We'll sort it in the desert. Expanded the capacity about 80%. Everybody in New York who had dredged and built new rail lines, guess what? It wasn't coming anymore because LA figured it out. Because guess what? They want to go to L.A. too, because there's a lot of people. Now, how do I get from L.A. and New York to Chicago, to Houston, to the other population centers? That's where the fight is. And, and I don't think any point of Maine is going to win that fight. We don't have Class 1 railroad connections. Um, we can't do it any faster. We don't have the port infrastructure already established. We don't have the political will that those towns have to make it happen. So I think any infrastructure that we build based on the notion that the Panama Canal is going to drive more container freight to Maine just ain't so. 
commercially it ain't so. Politically, we can have any discussion you want, but from a commercial perspective, the sea ships aren't coming here. 